Okay, so our first talk today is on, a, I don't really want to call it a talk, a lecture, it's going to be something we can all be involved in, but there's a couple of people here that have been involved in uh, jury rights, and I hate to say protests, because you weren't really protesting anything, you were just being there to try to record what was going on, and we were actually trying to exercise free speech rights to tell jurors what their rights are, and I would say their responsibilities too, they're, they're, they play a very important role in our society. To me, the importance of a jury is that the person that decides your guilt or innocence in your sentence is just going to be another one of the people and not a government employee. So it's such a key battleground to make sure that jurors know that they are deciding what's just and they have a right to decide what's just and fair. So what I want to do is uh, turn this over to Antonio, and he's known on the, the the web everywhere is bile or belay, is that it? <laughs> no, that's a French pronunciation. But anyway, uh, and he's had some experience with videotaping and uh, what goes on there. And uh, I'll let him take it from here. Everyone here, most people here know me, but uh, my name's Antonio Musumeci. I uh, uh, have a bunch of random things that I do, including a blog, uh, media website, uh, or content website for libertarian uh, co uh, media, uh, like books and pamphlets and things. Uh, that's libertyactivism.info. I do a radio show with uh, Bosco and some other people here at Fort Fest, uh, Tennyson and uh, Darren Warden, called Thinking Liberty, which can be found at thinkingliberty.net. And uh, the reason I'm here is to talk about, uh, well, I guess Fija, uh, fully informed jury information, and uh, which is a organization dedicated to propagating the ideas of jury nullification. Now, I'm not involved in FIJA. I sort of got in this because of a gentleman by the name of Julian Heichel. No. Julian is a 78-year-old Jewish man who is very passionate about jury rights. He has for, well, for a long time, at least since the late 90s, decided that it was going to be something that he wanted to uh, involve himself in, uh, was propagating this idea. And in the late 90s, he tried uh, smoking pot to get himself arrested so that he could attempt to use jury nullification to nullify a guilty, which would have been almost guaranteed because he was not denying the fact that he was smoking marijuana. He was a professor at the time at Pennsylvania State University, so he just bought weed off of probably some college student, smoked it, was told that he, a cop came over, told him, I guess assuming that he was just some old man that didn't know what was going on, and said, don't do that again, and just gave him a warning. And so he did it again the next week, and was told, don't do that again. And eventually he got arrested, but he didn't stop. He just kept doing it over and over and over again for months, as far as I know and was uh, eventually got to the point where he was suing every cop, every uh, like magistrate, every you know uh, lawyer involved in the whole thing, and the county judge said, don't arrest this man again, he's causing us too much problem. Uh, eventually he, he uh, in the, the, the later aughts, he uh, was doing a protest against uh, Ahmadinejad at the UN was arrested. He's civilly disobedient, so he goes face down. He was arrested and uh, for refusing to move or refusing to do what the cops told him to, even though he was completely in his right to be there. He uh, he again took that as an advantage to sue everyone involved and is still going to court, as far as I know, over that same issue from nearly four years ago. But in t late 2009. Uh, I think related to that case that I just explained, he decided to do jury outreach in front of 500 Pearl Street, this uh, New York District Court in Manhattan, and he uh, was, it was total outreach. He wasn't protesting, he really just was there, it was a one-time thing really to hand out information to potential jurors who Monday was the day that they show up, and he was told he can't do that by Federal Protection Service agents and the local courthouse people. And he therefore took out his pocket constitution, said, the First Amendment says I can, and I'm not going to stop. He put away his constitution, the cops left, came back a couple minutes later and arrested him. He went down on the ground, They and completely limp, refused to acknowledge their existence, 
they picked him up, put him into a uh, uh, an ambulance, and drove drove him to Belleville Hospital, where he stayed until eventually he spoke with one of the psychiatrists there, and they found that he wasn't too crazy, at least any more crazy than any other libertarian, and let him go. I think he signed his release papers, John Galt, uh, as, as he went. Uh, and they didn't know who he was. He refused to acknowledge or identify himself. Uh, but because of this, he went back the next week, the next or the next Monday, and got arrested in the same manner. And he went back the next week and got arrested in the same manner. And on that day, he uh, was shot up with Thorazine against his will and kept overnight. And that's, that's how I found out about it. There was an article written about it in The Examiner by Gary Reed, and... Uh, who uh, explained the whole incident, and I live near this gentleman, Dar uh, Julian Heikland, and and I work in downtown Manhattan where the courthouse is, so I decided to film it. That's what I do, I film a lot of things. So it's, it's easier than actually getting involved. <laughs> and so I showed up and I, was, I did an interview with Julian, and the cops approached him and said he couldn't do what he was doing, and uh, approached me and asked who I worked for, which I found odd, and so I, he sort of ignored me then and went back to Julian. Julian refused to stop, refused to obey any of the things the cop was saying. I backed up, you know, knowing that he was going to be arrested, and started filming. I was arrested about a minute later, without warning. He just he asked me who I worked for. I said I was a producer for Free Talk Live, and then he just arrested me without, without warning. They confiscated my camera. They never patted me down, though, and they didn't realize that I had a spy cam on my belt loop, and therefore captured the entire thing online, right. which could be found at YouTube slash blog of bile. Um, the so, Iyali. What's that? The Iyali. Yes. Uh, just one word, blog of bile. And uh, I'll, I'll give any, out all my websites if you ever want them later. But uh, so I then contacted after that the NYCLU, um, eventually, we got the, the whole thing dismissed. Uh, they give you a citation. It's basically a, like a fancy parking ticket, but from the federal government. We, we got that fully dismissed, and now we're suing the Department of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, Clifford Barnes, no, officer number 245, who was the arresting officer for myself and Julian, not only prior to that date, but every time he's been arrested since, which is like another seven times. Uh, and then John Doe, who uh, an officer reviews to identify himself. So this is how I got more involved. I had been aware of jury nullification prior. I never did outreach. And actually, I still don't do outreach, but I'll speak about it because I know the topic and I'm involved in suing the federal government over <laughs> filming someone who was arrested for doing cruel, uh, outreach. And uh, so a background of jury nullification, which might have been good before, but... This is, that's why. So, so jury nullification goes back to 16th century or so, 16th, 17th century uh, British common law, where the peasants, you know, the, the, those who lived on the land were fed up with the lords just being able to give arbitrary diktats as to what they, you know, what the laws were. They would just make things up. The king would make things up. Uh, the lords would make things up. And they were able to gain through... The, the standard practice, the English practice of common law, this ability to say, well, this guy is not guilty, not because he didn't commit the crime, but because the crime he's being accused of is not a crime, it's bogus. He, he didn't actually hurt anyone, uh, you know, this is just some rule of man that, you know, the Lord made up. Uh, and the practice slowly evolved, uh, and but was never widely used. Uh, and the, the government of the, the British government, along with any of its sort of colonies or subsidiaries, you know, America, uh, Australia, or uh, I, I assume that it's also perhaps in India and whatnot, uh, it was, the government always tried to suppress information about jury nullification because obviously it, it opposes their control. And in America, it's most notably used uh, by abolitionists during, after the federal government passed the Fugitive Slaves Act, Fugitive Slave Act, uh, they, particularly like in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, the state nullified the Fugitive Slave Act across the whole state, but outside of uh, Massachusetts, 
uh, individuals would say, well, you were caught with a slave, that's a, and now you're responsible for that according to the federal government, but we're abolitionists, we disagree with slavery, so therefore, you know, you're not guilty of the crime of disobeying the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, it was also used during Prohibition for your buddy down the road who was a bootlegger, he gets caught, you are happen to be on the jury, and you're like, well, you know, no, he's not, not guilty, he didn't do anything wrong. The 18th Amendment is bogus, this guy's you know, fine. And uh, eventually, as the, so the, you know, the 18th Amendment is repealed, but the drug war starts picking up in the 50s, and, and particularly in the 60s, uh, and there was, I don't remember the court case, and I don't remember if it was in the Supreme Court or like Court of Appeals, but there was a case that got up high level in federal court where the, an individual had sued saying that the court had not provided sufficient information about jury notification or no information about jury notification. And that because of that, I, I don't know if the guy had lost his case and thought that you know, the jury would have been uh, sympathetic to it and you know, disagreed with the, with the law where he was found guilty. And it goes up high in the courts and the courts rule, jury notification, it's common knowledge that the court is under no obligation whatsoever to explain to the jurors that they have this power, which is really the ultimate power, that the people have the power uh, to nullify any unjust laws. And since then, uh, which even at the time, it wasn't common knowledge, but after that, it was even less so. So courts, even if you had a sympathetic judge to jury notification, he was under no obligation, and so he could be pressured into not explaining it. And that just continued until we get to today, where no one anywhere talks about jury notification, except for organizations and those individuals related to, like, FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury Association. And, but it is still common throughout the United States. It may not be in Louisiana because of the, their judicial system is much different than the rest of the U.S. because of their background, but I'm not really familiar about, with that. Uh, but jury nullification is still possible throughout the United States, and uh, so individuals like myself, through proxy and directly like Julian Heiklin, go about trying to educate people by standing in, often by standing in front of courthouses and you know waiting for that jury date and just handing them things. The biggest problem that we have is that individuals who bring up. Uh, jury nullification when they're on, you know, a panel to be pulled for jury are instantly ejected because no one wants you there uh, and they have free reign to just eject whoever, right? So, uh, so if you bring it up, then you're gone if you, beforehand. If you bring it up after you're there, they'll just replace you with someone else and therefore you can't educate people while you're there, uh, while you have the power to actually utilize it. Um, or at least, usually you don't have that ability. And so you really have to do it outside the court while you're not part of the system. And uh, funny thing is, Julian, who was here doing another FIJA uh, presentation yesterday, he's got jury duty next week. Uh, and he was doing his tour. He went to Albany on two, Monday or Tuesday, and then he went to Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, where he was arrested and uh, beat up by the hospital. They pounded on his chest to see if he would speak. And he's 78 and bruises easily, and he now has very, very obvious uh, yellow and black and blue marks all across, across his chest. Uh, it's awful. There's pictures online that some people have taken, and it's, he said that they also pushed something up his nose so far that he was compelled to cry like, and nearly scream out in pain. And he overheard the nurses saying that they were doing that just to get a pain re response because he refused to talk. And, uh, you know, it, it's awful enough if they do that to anyone, but for a man of his age, it was, it's just horrifying, really. And, uh, but he takes it in stride. He knows that this is possible. It's happened to him before, so he's a big inspiration to a lot of people. Where did that happen?